Hello, everyone. Um, today we're going to kind of take a step back from what we've been doing the last couple of days. Uh, the last couple of days we've been talking about interactions between objects using system schema to represent them. And we even started yesterday looking at the forces that act and drawing force diagrams. We even developed a new law, Newton's first law of motion, uh, and a new way to explain why things move the way they move. But now I want to take a little historical approach to forces. Remember, forces are an interaction between two objects resulting in a push or a pull. And in fact, I want to go way back, way, way back to the time of one of my ancient Greek forebears, Aristotle, lived from about 384 to 322 BC. Aristotle had a way of looking at the world and motion and forces um, that pretty much held sway for a couple of thousand years, two millennia. Uh, and it was a very important uh, kind of step. And some of you probably think, just like an Aristotelian, so it might be nice to kind of take a look at what Aristotle thought and then build to what we now think. So Aristotle basically uh, separated the universe, or the cosmos, if you will, in Greek, into a couple of things. There was the earthly region, right, the sublunary region, that means under the moon. Right? And this is the, uh, where we lived. This was all corrupt and changey. This is where um, things changed. They didn't stay the same. It wasn't constant. Things were born and matured and died. Right? And then you had the heavens. And the heavens were perfect. And the heavens were up there. Right? They had to be up there. Right? That's where the heavens were. And there was no change in the heavens because to Aristotle, things being the same was a beautiful thing. All right? No change at all. Now, the sublunary region, or Earth, if you will, was broken up itself into elements. You had Earth, the heaviest of the four elements. You then had water, air, and fire. And to Aristotle, these four things composed everything in the universe. Everything in the universe was either Earth, water, air, fire, or some combination. Now, on the other hand, the heavens out there in space, right, out there above us, it too was filled. It was filled with something called ether. And I'm using here the old English spelling of ether so you don't confuse it with the anesthetic ether, okay, it's something different. Sometimes it was called quintessence. What is this quintessence of dust, as Hamlet would say? And, and so to Aristotle, space was actually filled. It, it was filled with this ether. And this ether moved around the Earth in perfect circles. Perfect, perfect circles. Everything had to be perfect in the heavens. Because if the ancient Greeks looked up into the sky, they basically saw all the stars, right? Of course, they didn't have any, any uh, light pollution like we do now, so they had a nice clear view. But there were just a small handful of things that wandered around the night sky. They didn't stay in the same configuration with all the other stars. And they were bright things, you could see them, but they didn't stay uh, in pattern. And so the Greeks called them wanderers. Of course, they spoke Greek, right? So instead of calling them wanderers, they called them planets. Bet you didn't know that, right? Planet actually means wanderer in ancient Greek. So these were the things that wandered around the night sky. And so to try to explain that, they imagined that there were spherical shells of ether around the Earth. And uh, each shell had a planet embedded in it. And that shell would rotate around the Earth. Right? And that way, the, um, the planet could be moving on its own orbit around the Earth. And then there'd be another shell with another planet embedded in it, another shell with another planet. And then the outside was the celestial sphere. And that's the one that had all the stars embedded in it. Right? One sphere. That way they all moved together right? as they rotated around the Earth. Okay, so this was the Aristotelian belief in the heavens. In fact, they eventually thought of them as being filled with crystal spheres. They had to be crystal so you could see through from one level to the other. This was some fancy stuff, this ether or quintessence. Now, Aristotle broke up motion into only two kinds. Two kinds of motion he explained everything according to Aristotle. One was what was known as natural motion. And this was when objects were trying to return to their natural place. So, to an Aristotelian thinker, if you held something up in the air and you let it go, it would fall to Earth because it was made of Earth. And therefore, its natural place was the Earth. 
so it would return there. When it rains, rain falls down and then flows downhill to the rivers and streams, which themselves flow downhill to the lakes and oceans. Why? Because they're made of water. And that's the natural place for water to be. Light a fire and what comes out of it? Smoke. Right? Smoke is mostly made of air and air is up there. So smoke rises. Right? So things are trying to return to their natural place and natural motion basically straight up or straight down. So you could explain a lot of motion that way. But now sometimes you might have something, say a big rock that's on the ground. It's in its natural place. And if it's in its natural place, it's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to sit there. You have absolute motion, things trying to return to their natural place. And then you have absolute rest. Once they get there, they stay there. But of course, you could pick up a rock and move it from its natural place, in which case you were imposing violent motion upon the rock. Right? This is motion imposed by some outside force. And to an Aristotelian, that motion only lasted so long as you were applying the force. Hey, you push that rock, it moves. As soon as you let it go, it goes back to its natural place and stops. So this was the way that the Aristotelians thought of motion. And if you look at it here, you can kind of see how their religion would get wrapped up with their physics or their natural philosophy, as they would have called it in those days. So this had some consequences right, to the ancient Greek mind. One was how they viewed our uh, solar system. Okay. Um, the earth, created, of course, by the gods, must be in its natural place. And if it's in its natural place, the only way for the earth to move would be to impose violent motion upon the earth. And a force big enough to move the earth is unthinkable. Therefore, the earth doesn't move. And we have what is known as the Ptolemaic uh, or geocentric solar system. Ptolemy, by the way, was uh, another ancient Greek, although not so ancient, 2nd century AD. We really don't have good dates for when he was born and died. Um, he worked mostly in Alexandria in ancient Egypt. And so the Ptolemaic or geocentric solar system is the one that you've probably seen with Earth at the center, and everything moves around the Earth, including the sun. It does kind of look that way, right? You go and you look outside, sun rises in the east and sets in the west, looks like it's moving around the Earth. And as they went through the centuries, that's kind of the predominant thing. Everything moved in perfect circles around the Earth, the Earth being the center of the universe. But as they got better and better data, even though it was naked eye data, data without telescopes yet, okay, they found that sometimes the planets did weird things that didn't make sense with this everything being embedded in crystal spheres rotating around the Earth. For example, some planets will go into what's called retrograde. It'll have retrograde motion. And that means for several days, instead of going the same direction across the sky, they'll move backwards for a few days. And then they'll go back forwards again. Well, how the heck are you going to explain that with crystal spheres spinning in one direction? It's something going into retrograde. So they came up with this new idea. This new idea was, were called epicycles that were moving along deference. <laughs> and epicycles, the way it was set up was that the planets would move in circles while moving in bigger circles. And so that seems kind of weird here. So we have um, a planet here. This is a vast exaggeration. We have the Earth, right? We've got the deferent, and some deferents were on the Earth, and some were just a little off center. And the planet moved in an epicycle. And so it moved in a circle while it was moving in a circle. And you might be able to see here how that would mean that it would go backwards for a few nights and then forwards. Let me show you a demo of this I found online. this thing okay so this is uh, the planet Mars right here there's the earth there's the deferent for Mars there's the epicycle for Mars so I'm gonna put this into motion and don't worry about I don't know why they have all of the uh, the weird uh, zodiac things in there as well <laughs> all right, but there's Mars right, going in a circle while going in a circle it's moving in a circle while moving in a circle and you can see like right now it would be moving backwards in the night sky from Earth, and then it would go forwards again. And it might even change some speed as it was going as you looked at it from the Earth. And there's a sun outside. And so this was the idea. And in order to actually fit the data, they eventually had to get to the point of having something like 
40 different epicycles in deference for the planets that they could see. This wasn't all the planets we know now. These were the planets you could see with the naked eye. So the Ptolemaic system got extremely complex, circles on circles on circles on circles, until a Polish monk thought there must be a better way. Now, you've heard of this guy before, but you may not have known he was a Polish monk. We are talking about Nicholas Copernicus, 1473 to 1543. Besides being a Polish Catholic monk, monk, Nicholas Copernicus was also an astronomer. And he looked at this motion of these planets and said, there's got to be a different way to organize this. So he came up with what is known as the Copernican or heliocentric solar system. Heliocentric, by the way, helio is Greek for sun, so that's sun-centered. Geocentric, geo is earth, so that's earth-centered solar system. So this is the one that you're probably more familiar with now as a modern person that you are, with the sun at the center and the planets orbiting around the sun. This, in fact, over here is a copy of a picture from his book uh, that he published on the revolutions of the celestial orbs, which was published in 1543 in Nuremberg. Um, that's the year that he died. The story is that he knew that this would be very controversial, and so he had to be convinced by his friends to publish this idea. And he published it and got the first copy of his book just in time to die so that he didn't have to worry about all the controversy that erupted out of this. So he said the Earth was essentially just one of many things that are orbiting the sun. This caused a whole lot of problems. People had serious problems with this idea of a Copernican or heliocentric solar system. First of all, how could we possibly be moving? I mean, if the Earth is moving around the sun and spinning while it's moving, why don't we all fly off? You've been on a merry-go-round, goes really fast, right? You'd fly off if you weren't strapped into it. So why isn't everything flying off the Earth? There were some serious religious implications as well. Because now, instead of the Earth being special, as made by God, now it's just one of many things orbiting the sun. It's not so special anymore. And at this point, this point of Copernicus, this is after the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther and the tacking up on the door and breaking apart from the Catholic Church, after the Catholic Counter-Reformation when they tried to bring everybody back into the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church at this point did not want to have new ideas out there that might contradict what they were saying because they were afraid that they'd lose people. And so this idea that the earth could be just one of many things moving around the sun after they had been teaching that the earth was the center of the universe serious religious issues. And then there was something called stellar parallax. It's a weird one. Kind of cool though. Imagine that the earth is moving around the sun, right? Here it is in June. Here it is in December. Well, if we looked at a star, the same star in June and December, right, this star should look like it's at two different places with the background stars, depending on when we look at it, right? We see in straight lines. We think of light as going in straight lines. And so in June, it should look like it's over here. In December, it should look like it's over here with regard to the background stars. And we don't actually see that with the naked eye. It looks like all the stars basically stay together. Well, there is an explanation for why we don't see stellar parallax with the naked eye. It's because the, the stars are all really, really far away. I mean, try to do this. Hold your thumb out in front of your face and right, you know, in the center. And close one eye and then close the other and look at the wall. Do you see how the, your thumb looks like it's moving with respect to the wall when you close one eye and then the other? Now hold your thumb really far away and close one eye and then the other. It doesn't look like it's moving as much, does it? And if it gets really far away, you can barely notice it. We actually do see stellar parallax, um, but only with high-powered telescopes. You can't see it with the naked eye because everything's just too far away. So that gets rid of one problem. But we still have the physics problems, how can we be on a moving earth, and the religious problems. Into this walks one of the great men that we're going to talk about this year, Galileo Galilei, 1564 to 1642. Um, you're going to hear about him a bit in the movie, but he trained to be a uh, doctor. But he was at uh, the university and found that they didn't have a professor of mathematics, so he dropped out of med school, taught himself mathematics, and got himself appointed to be uh, a professor. And Galileo was firmly a Copernican. He believed that the Earth moved around the sun, not the other way around. And so he set out to try to figure out how we could possibly be on a moving Earth. And this is going to lead us to Newton's first law. We're going to see this in the movie we will watch tomorrow and then the demos we will do afterwards.